The panel I was on at CAA was titled, Good Business is the Best Art. If good business is the best art, as that famous Andy Warhol dictum would have us believe, then what can we say about great business? Can a business be too efficient, too powerful, too savvy to qualify as great art? The history of modern and contemporary art is peppered with practices we could, out of, conven out of convenience, call business art. Experimental artists run institutions, artists' stores, and entrepreneurial schemes that tend to be reckless, to do business against the business, as one critic puts it. But when artist-run businesses actually turn a profit, they tend to be met not with acclaim, but with suspicion, but all but their closest supporters. Today, if we had to single out one artist-run institution that appears too good to be business art, and that summons more suspicion than critical engagement in public discourse, it might be Eflux, a commercial enterprise founded by Anton Vidocla in 1998. So as the legend is told, the Eflux idea was simple. After discovering the potential for email to connect art workers operating in an increasingly fragmented and dispersed global art world, Vidocla assembled the beginnings of an online mailing list that would function as a proxy between art institutions and an expanding global public. Serving as a distribution platform for exhibition announcements and press releases, Eflux would charge a pay-per-use pay fee to institutions that wanted to use their list to promote their events while offering a free service to subscribers who wanted to stay informed. And as the Eflux mailing list grew, so did its value as a resource and an asset. 17 years later, and that's a long time, having amassed a database of over 90,000 email addresses, Eflux has become a powerful infra infrastructure for the global circulation of our world news. Accordingly, it can and does charge its clients a premium. And with the undisclosed income generated from this platform, it is able to employ a small staff, provide health insurance, rent a two-story office and exhibition space in the Lower East Side, and finance an ever-expanding array of pro programs and projects such as Eflux Journal, a uh, monthly online journal featuring the latest and greatest in critical theory, uh, the Eflux Program, uh, which features regular events and exhibitions in, at its New York headquarters, Eflux Projects, uh, a series of temporary and curatorial initiatives designed for museums, galleries, biennials, and most recently, Eflux Conversations, an online forum for discussion and debate. For Vidocla, while Eflux can be seen as a publishing platform and archive, curatorial platform and enterprise, it is at its root, and this is Vidocla's perspective specifically, a work of art that uses circulation both as form and content. So in other words, it is really good business art. And as business art, Eflux has its own corporate mythology, uh, which Vidocla traces back to a moment before artist run culture was irreparably co-opted by state and market forces. So this was the time of Fluxus, a pioneering networked organization that in the 1960s and 70s recognized the potential for distribution to function as a site for creative experimentation. Many of Eflux's initiatives reinvest in the legacy of Fluxus and its successors. One can think of Pawn Shop uh, from, from 2007-2008, which is a temporary storefront for art sales that approximates the thematic structure of George Matsyunas' legendary Flux Shop from 1965, or we could look at Eflux Video Rental uh, from 2004, which is a free video rental service that holds a similar function, we could say, to the Vancouver Group Intermedia's video exchange directory from 1971, and even if we look at the um, uh, logo, there's something going on here. <laughs> Likewise, the Eflux mailing list, uh, which is the infrastructural base for all of its projects, recalls the various artist directories assembled by George Mass Yunus at the Fluxus headquarters in New York, Ken Friedman at Fluxus West in San Diego, and numerous others involved in the growing mail art network of the late 1960s and early 1970s. These directories together form a connective tissue between geographically dispersed artists, a decentralized infrastructure for correspondence that Robert Filiou and George Brecht named the Eternal Network. And finally, to state the obvious, the name Eflux reads like a Fluxus upgrade for the internet age. Like thousands of other companies restructured during the dot-com bubble of the late 1990s, Eflux augments Fluxus with the prefix E, performing a rebranding ritual that was banned. So my concern today is not, is not to dispute this Eflux corporate mythology, or to contest the link between Fluxus and Eflux that Vidocla continues to put on the table. Instead, I want to follow Vidocla's lead down a path from Fluxus to Eflux, a path that may help, help us uncover some of the broader effects of neoliberal enterprise culture 
on the meaning and implications of artistic self-organization? Have the entrepreneurial models privileged under neoliberalism and made possible by the internet delivered a new version of the eternal network? And how might the history of the artist directory, increasingly privatized, monetized, and of course digitized over the course of the late 20th century, help us approach Eflux's particular brand of business art? So what follows is an abbreviated sketch of a complex history, a very partial description of a network of artists working between New York, Vancouver, and Toronto as they expanded the eternal network until it began to turn against them. This note, taken from the journal of Michael Morris, one half of Vancouver's Image Bank, a post-Fluxus artist-run project dedicated to the art of distribution, describes three overlapping positions available to artists working at the turn of the 1970s. One could work within the established system of art galleries, museums, magazines, and auction houses in a condition of relative subservience, as, mo as most artists did and continue to do. One could use the existing system to one's advantage, using the, its tools to undermine it from within, or, one could create new infrastructures that circumvent the terms set by the ruling order. If the second position recalls early experience in institutional critique, the third describes the conceptual basis for the alternative space movement, a decentralized and utopian project which, at least in its earliest years, imagined that artists could forge a space for independence from institutions that were seen by many to be repressive, stiflingly bureaucratic, exclusive, hierarchical, and <coughs> unaccountable, uh, unaccountable to the constituencies they claim, claim to serve. So among the myriad innovations of this mo movement were artist-run exhibition and performance spaces, artist magazines, and a wide range of artistic services that use the International Postal Service as an alternative infrastructure for collaboration and sales. So our story does not begin with the emergence of the eternal network, but with an early critique of mail art leveled by some of its most active contributors. The earliest mailing lists compiled by Ray Johnson and others involved with the New York Correspondence School tended to be closely guarded and circulated only between artists who were um, recommended by or trusted uh, by trusted members of the network. So suspicious of newcomers and relying upon the restriction of information to maintain their form, these early mail art networks came to be criticized for performing gatekeeping measures that simply replicated the art world's hierarchical power structure. So Ken Friedman, for one, believes that if critics, dealers, curators, and other arts professionals could maintain the relevance as gatekeepers and cultural mediators by strategically restricting access to communication from artists, that artists could only emancipate themselves from these conditions of dependency by if they publicized mailing lists they were actively building in private. So Friedman's perspective, which was disseminated through the list he managed as founder of Flexus West, gave a political meaning to the project of sharing and aggregating mailing lists a project that would quickly alter the function of the eternal network in, New in North America and Europe. So between the years 1970 and 1974, the mail art uh, network ascended from its position of relative obscurity, largely through a mail major uh, survey of mail art at the Whitney Museum of American Art in 1970, a prominent feature uh, in Rolling Stone magazine in 1972, and a series of media savvy publishing ventures by Canadian art groups General Idea and, and uh, Image Bank. In fact, it was ImageBank that took the lead in pursuing this open access artist directory, imagined by Ken Friedman, uh, aggregating lists from Fluxus, the New York Correspondence School, Ant Farm, and Canada's growing state-funded artist run network to produce the International Image Exchange Directory in 1972. Selections from this directory were featured in the first several issues of File Magazine, a new mail art and counterculture journal edited by General Idea between 1972 and 1989. Printed in an edition of 3,000, distributed across North America and Europe, and profiled in magazines like Art in America, Avalanche, Studio International, and Flash Art just in its first two years, File played a major role in expanding the reach of the artist directory and opening up the eternal network to new constituencies. In its rapid transition from a semi-private network to a widely distributed open access artist directory, the Eternal Network began, as curator of Ensemble Nan writes in the catalog for this exhibition, Documentary Protocols, which was <coughs> at Concordia in the Ellen Gallery, to deteriorate from within. Almost as soon as the artist directory appeared in the pages of File Magazine, Ken Friedman began to receive complaints. Addresses that were only meant for a few were released to the public, exposing artists who had little interest in correspondence art to daily piles of junk mail. In an attempt to deal with this problem, a problem that related both the violation of trust by groups determined to publish comprehensive address lists 
and the misuse of these lists by overexcited contributors, Friedman distributed a memo through the Kupfatsis mailing list, presenting his intention to institute a code of ethics called the Mailing List Use Contract Agreement. However, because the internal network did not rely on any centralized mediating agent, this ethical code would have little effect on the shifting use of the artist directory. And for its part, File Magazine, surely among the greatest offenders of Friedman's ethical code, appeared to take pleasure in the rising controversy. In the September 1973 issue of File, its editors featured a series of scathing reviews of the growing network. Letters from Ray Johnson, Robert Cumming, and Ant Farms' Hudson Marquez attest to the proliferation of junk mail circulating through the Eternal Network after File first, pub first published in Advanced Iris Directory. While Cummings worries about the enormous waste of paper flowing through the network, Marquez objects to the, network, the use of the network by young artists advertising their shows. They all agree, as Marquez colorfully declares, none of us can keep up with the shit flowing out of the bowels of the USA mail scene. The story of the artist directory confronts us with an early warning sign that an open source, open access ethos cannot generate a more egalitarian society in itself. The Eternal Network, as a kind of decentralized open access artist directory, was to a large degree a casualty of this ethos, an ethos that ignores the fact that enclosure, protection, and secrecy can be useful to the maintenance of self-organized infrastructures. So in the interim between Fluxus and Eflux, a new regime of power has emerged, one that operates not hierarchically through institutions, but uh, horizontally through vectors of communication and information exchange, this much we know. So faced with the rise of network business models and the disintegration of many of our public institutions, including uh, our arts councils, of course, we, we certainly need new emancipatory myths, new ways of orienting the project of artist self-organization at least if we choose not to abandon the project entirely, so we can't look nostalgically at this failed past. Anton de Dokle has offered a model for self-organizing in the current context, one that mirrors the entrepreneurial startup culture that continues to thrive under neoliberalism. So more specifically, Eflux does not desire independence from capitalist infrastructures of profit production. Instead, it aims, it aims to own and manage those infrastructures. If an artist-run organization can control the infrastructures through which artists and institutions communicate, it can gain autonomy from both. And not by dropping out or by seeking any kind of alternative system, by, but by seizing power, by designing and administering the systems through which artists, arts professionals, and institutions must function to retain their visibility uh, and relevance. And this, of course, is not a model that every uh, artist from an institution can take, which is precisely the idea there's only room for one efflux. Case in point, consider the organization's latest major campaign. It's been in 2012 to develop and, and administer the arts domain, a new top-level domain like .com, .org, etc., uh, that, that is projected to transform the way the, that the internet is organized in the coming years. Competing against numerous venture capitalist firms, efflux promises to use its experience in the field of art to ensure that the .art domain emphasizes the quality, content, and, and educational values of the community of people, um, of, of the, the community of people who create, study, present, and love art, and that is to serve the same constituency, the same community it currently represents through its announcement service. So endowed with the authority to manage the meaning and use of the dot art domain, to curate the web, so to speak, Eflex will be given, as one critic worries, uh, the opportunity to wield a kind of centralized power that seems incongruous not only with the egalitarian politics advanced through Eflux's editorial, but also with the concept of the internet as a shared resource. But of course, the internet today is far from a shared resource. With the transition from print to the internet, corporations have increasingly relied on the ownership of data, infrastructures, and vectors of communication in the pursuit of profit. As Ken Wark, who was here last night, ar argues elsewhere, this transition has ushered in a new ruling class that he likes to call the victorialist class. He's used this word for the last 10 years. Eflux recognize the sim rec recognizes the symbolic and financial value that can be extracted from vectors of communication, and as such, it maintains a strange affinity with what we could call the ruling class of our time. And this might be why, despite its consistency, consistent output of engaged leftist discourse on politics, art, and technology, Eflux continues to leave me a bit confused and ambivalent. 
It marks an unprecedented triumph of artist self-organization over the institutional hierarchies that traditionally governed the art world. It kind of won. But as a self-organized enterprise, it champions a myth of, indep of independence based on the privatization of culture and its delivery systems. So let me be clear, Eflux is not to blame for the implosion of network utopia in the art world. As our story of the Eternal Network shows, this preceded Eflux by 20 years. Rather, by, by continuing a process already well underway, it simply had the foresight to capitalize on the new desires, rituals, and business practices emerging with the rise of neoliberal enterprise culture. Eflux reformats the history of artist self-organization for a new era defined by privatization, feeding on the anemic bloodline of artist-run culture and spitting out its inverse. It tells us that there is no alternative like the best pictorialists do. This makes for great business, good business art, and the nightmare of the eternal network.